So with that, let's get started with the, the final keynote of the conference by Rob Metcalf, titled uh, Field Experiments and Regulated Markets. Rob is an Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Southern California, where he's been since 2020. Um, so looking at the evolution of his work over time, you can see from very early on, one of his main focuses has been thinking about how we identify and measure people's well-being, which I think is a cornerstone of our work uh, as economists. And more recently, Rob has been a pioneer in thinking big and using really impressive, innovative field experiments to understand some of the most pressing questions that we face, especially around energy conservation, pollution, and climate change, both from the consumer side as well as working with governments and within firms uh, to design information for in interventions that use sort of behavioral uh, economics to reduce negative externalities. So at the same time, I've learned a lot, especially from his work on how to cleverly design experiments to, to really understand wealth, welfare effects of policies um, and interventions, including his work on uh, subsidies for energy efficiency and the use of public recognition. Um, and, and from looking at his website, there's so many projects there in the pipeline that I'm looking forward to seeing. Uh, so as his work has evolved and become recognized with multiple publications at top journals, as well as, ha well as having over 5,000 citations on Google Scholar, uh, he has moved from doing his PhD at Imperial College London to being a postdoc at the University of Chicago. And then prior to being at USC, he was an assistant professor at the Questrom School of Business at Boston University. And in the meantime, out of all of this work, he's also managed to co-found two consultancies to help governments and businesses using behavioral science, which is a testament to the demand and uh, quality and importance of his work. So with that, we're really uh, happy to have Rob here today to talk about field experiments, regulated markets, and I'll turn it over to you, Rob. Thanks again. Thanks, Jared, for the kind introduction. Much appreciated. And thank you all for, for having me uh, at this great conference. So this is my first ever keynote. Uh, so I, I went to the social media world and said, you know, what should I talk about today? So I give a list of sort of four uh, responses. Uh, the poll on the left is from LinkedIn, on the right from Twitter. And it seems like most people want me to talk about sort of a combination of the work that I've done in the past and work that I'm currently doing. Uh, many more work that I'm currently doing. So what I'll do today, I'll, I'll talk about the research that I've done in, in markets that are predominantly regulated. And then I'll talk about, you know, some of the, the, the papers that I've already been published, but I'll spend about 10, 15 minutes on that. And then I'll move towards sort of the projects that I'm currently doing uh, in regulated markets and why I think, uh, you know, we all should be trying to do experiments in this market and convincing you of some of the benefits of doing so. So, and as Jared said, like if you have any questions, you know, feel free to, to interrupt or, or, or raise your hand. Hopefully I'll see that or, or Jared will ask me a question. That'll be, that'll be perfect. Very happy to have like an interactive active session here. So I think I spent most of my time um, in, in my PhD, my graduate school, and then working for the government for a couple of years in the UK, and then um, uh, moving to Chicago and, and being a postdoc in the econ department of Chicago um, to think more about, you know, how, how do governments and, and, and how do regulated entities actually generate evidence to know what is the optimal amount of regulation for that market. And so there are a range of, of markets under the purview of regulators to figure out how do they want to regulate to maximize the objective function. Now, figuring out what's the objective function of regulators is not necessarily an easy job, but, but figuring out what are some of the parameters that they might care about to establish, I think, is, is a really interesting research question that leads very well to the use of field experiments. So uh, one of the areas is, is thinking about, um, oops, sorry. Uh, oh, okay. One of the areas um, is in thinking about externalities, and that can come from sort of energy use, both in the residential and the commercial side. It could be through uh, water scarcity. It could be uh, congestion in, in public and, and private transit. And so a lot of these regulators are trying to figure out how can we get the, the, the demand for that, for those goods in the sense where the social marginal benefits equals the social marginal costs. And many regulators want to use subsidies to get more people to do good stuff, to use taxes to get more people to do less of the bad stuff, or maybe provide information or nudges to get the consumers or the, 
the buyers in the market to actually get their demand closer to what the optimal demand should be based on social marginal benefits and social marginal costs. So that's definitely an area where I think as field experimentalists, we can, we can help regulators. The second area is in thinking about network effects. So there are many companies, and this is very pertinent to think about Facebook and Google and, and how big they are. But in terms of you know, some of these companies should be allowed to, to grow to, to, to large levels and have some market power because of the network externalities, the network effects. And I think in sort of telecoms more generally, that's definitely been the case for the last 50 years. And regulators are interested in figuring out once you allow some competition in these uh, in these markets that have in the past maybe been public sector, but now moved to prioritization. How can you get consumers to be more active in looking for the right deals for them? And so there seems to be in like these concentrated markets, a lot of inertia. And so is this inertia, you know, uh, the right amount of inertia? Or is there ways that the regulator can sort of force the companies to engage in more competitive practices for consumers? So that's been like an interest of, of regulators for a while. And then thirdly, it's, it's um, thinking about sort of the merit goods. So like how do regulators think about working with companies to provide levels of say education or transport options for cities, for urban areas, where we're including more low-income individuals. And so there's been a lot of interest, especially in, in the US, for example, of thinking about how do private companies like the SAT or ACT actually help or hinder uh, the ability of students to go into college. And then lastly, it's kind of uh, how I so I was doing my PhD at the time. And then in the UK, a cabinet office set up the sort of behavioral insight team. And I was involved in that team early on uh, before I left the UK to go to, to, to the US. There's a lot of interest in governments in using sort of nudges or leveraging um, the ability that people might have behavioral frictions or incorrect beliefs and how we can actually correct those beliefs or correct the information and actually get people to behave as if their social marginal benefits equal the social marginal cost. So I think like what I've been interested in is how do governments actually use these sort of behavioral interventions across the different types of markets, could be externalities, could be network markets, could be merit goods, in thinking about, you know, how do they, how do they think that the benefits and costs of these nudges should be evaluated and how much do they actually force or persuade regulated entities like uh, companies in these markets to actually use these type of approaches. So I'll, I'll go through sort of these four areas today of work that I've done in the past that's been published and work that I'm currently doing where I'm picking upon some of these research questions that will hopefully lend itself to regulators having better information about what works and better information about the parameters in their um, objective function that they will then know, okay, should we regulate more or less these entities. So the lessons that I've learned in such markets is that usually um, the, the, the regulated entity wants to generate evidence to reduce <laughs> regulation or laws on them or to continue the existing levels without increasing them. So I think like a regulated entity is willing to, to supply the possibility of doing a field experiment with academics like us if they think that that will lead to some degree of a reduction in, in regulation or you know, a non-increasing level of regulation. And then the regulator on the other side does want to correct, um, does want to have correct evidence in terms of how to better regulate those markets and those entities. So I think now um, as we get a, a better educated government and public sector who understand evidence and they, they do, you know, causal inference in, 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 the, uh, in their college years, they start to realize how important, you know, getting at causal inference for some of their parameters is and how field experiments might be helpful. So some of the regulators that I've been talking to, 
who usually employ economists. It's not like these regulators are defunct of economists. They have economists. And they are interested in generating solid empirical evidence for some regulations. So I feel like there is plenty of scope to actually work with these regulators to actually generate field experiments that will hopefully help them as well. Okay, so, um, sorry, it's just, um, it's slow. So, so finding pro, uh, projects or, or policies that help both sides of the markets is kind of like the win-win. The it's kind of like the, 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 the niche area where if you can find those projects where you think both sides of the market wants to generate evidence, then I think you've got a really good opportunity to do a large field experiment with both sides of the market to understand, okay, like, should we regulate less? Should the regulation be different? I think sometimes the regulator can force the, the field experiment as well. So I've been in, in discussions and I've done field experiments where the field experiment has been, you know, mandated by the regulator to the regulated entity to do that field experiment and to show, you know, whether something worked or not. I think uh, there are three regulators in the UK, um, Ofcom, Ofgem and Ofwat that have in the past um, mandated field experiments and so the FCA, the, the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK. So four, four regulators in the UK have forced companies to run field experiments to generate evidence. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, I think we get into the stage where regulators want to know some of uh, the answers to, to their regulatory policies. And then, uh, you know, how how can I like with my knowledge help you in like working in this area, working in these markets? And I think like I don't have anything to add over John List's uh, Jet paper 2011 of like the 14 tips of how to do a field experiment with an organization. I think they all apply, but I would say what is sort of most pertinent uh, in this market is to be an expert uh, in that market. Um, so if that, you know, you're talking to that chief economist of the regulator, you actually want to know that, you know, that that economist wants to know that you actually understand what you're talking about, these markets, understand the costs and benefits um, of getting involved and intervening in this market. Secondly, you do need to have a champion within each organization, and that can be tough and it's time consuming. So you got to find someone who's usually like in the econ team or the chief economist of the regulator, and then find someone in sort of the policy team in the regulated identity that wants to generate evidence to maybe reduce regulation or to uh, keep regulation as it is. So I think you've got to find those champions in each team, in each organization, because they're the ones who are going to vouch for you. They're the ones who are going to sign your data use agreement, your NDA. They're the ones who are going to get you the data. And I think, you know, making sure that you have two champions is, is pretty important for these types of field experiments. And then lastly, the third thing is, is understand organizational dynamics. And I think John referred to the Adam effect in his paper that, you know, every, in every organization that's, that's niched uh, an idea of his, the person is called Adam. And I think there are these types of individuals um, in organizations that do not want to generate evidence on both sides, the regulator and the regulated identities. And so trying to figure out how to overcome some of these problems of the people that don't want to generate evidence I think you have to get there quick. You have to have those champions in the, each organization that has to like override those type of individuals that don't want to generate evidence. And then lastly is for some of the companies that I've been working with, I've actually helped them in, in developing systems, uh, both software and cultural systems to actually implement field experiments on a regular basis. So a lot of like these large corporations don't necessarily have, you know, 20 economists or 30 economists that are working at, at Uber or Lyft, for example. Like they, they have smaller teams in data science, they have smaller, smaller teams of economists. And so getting them to think more about, you know, how they can automate field experiments, how can they convince and influence the C-suite to care about field experiments, is something that I've been doing with a few organizations where I think the benefits of field experiments are large. 
So I'm definitely aware of like not being captured by these organizations and these, these, these private sector companies, but it's helping them in thinking about how do you create that system or that culture of field experiments, which will hopefully help me because I think there'll be papers and, and projects that will lead to a lot of good evidence about how these markets should be regulated. Okay, so those are the kind of things that I've, I've, I've these are very sort of top level things that I've learned so far in, in, in getting in the wedge between the regulator and the regulated entity. Um, it's, a, it's a fine line of, of, of how you get there, but once you get there, I think it opens up a lot of opportunities for doing some really cool field experiments. Okay. Okay, any questions about this before I move on to some of the, the papers that I've done and some of the projects that I'm going to? Okay, feel free to interrupt if, if any time if you want. So I think uh, I'll just give it like a really like five, 10 minute overview of some of the, the papers that I've done in some of these markets where I would say the economic profession has rewarded me well from doing these experiments. I think the, the econ profession does reward, you know, good field experiments that can help regulators make better decisions. So I think for the first experiment I ran was with Virgin Atlantic. Um, so this is a paper with John List and, and Greer Gosnell, where we were able to partner with Virgin Atlantic to be able to understand how can we actually reduce feral use in the aviation sector. And predominantly, most of these markets, for example, are not part of any carbon tax or cap and trade. So the prices are not equal to the social marginal cost. And so we wanted to figure out, is there a new approach of thinking about how to reduce uh, pollution from the aviation sector beyond just the traditional tools? So we work with Virgin Atlantic to come up with different ways that we could motivate the workers to actually improve their fuel efficiency at different parts of the flight. Um, by employees, I mean their captains, the captains who fly their planes for them. And so what we did was we actually randomized different intensities of management practices. Some of the work by like Nick Bloom and John Van Rien and Raphael Sajan that's built up this huge literature of all these, all the things that are correlated with productivity on the management side, we actually did a field experiment on randomizing the different elements of these management practices across the captains. And what we found was actually these captains do have margins in their workplace to actually change fuel efficiency. So how much fuel they put onto the plane, that's again, as a captain's decision. Uh, how they fly their plane, so how they have continuous ascent, continuous descent, the right amount of speed as they go over the Atlantic, uh, how they turn their engines off, whether they're being taxied in or taxied out, all these margins captains get involved with. And so based on that paper, we're able to show that about you know 5% of um, fuel use in the aviation sector is coming from variation of captain's performance with respect to these behaviors that impact on fuel efficiency. So if you can get like a 5% reduction on an increasing share of emissions in the world, that's like pretty, pretty nice. But these practices are really low cost. Uh, and so as a result of this paper, uh, I created uh, a company called Signal that um, sort of takes on the work from this paper, but does it in a very more automatic and scale up approach. So now we have like a platform where airlines buy into the platform and we take the data and we give the captains sort of the best management practices based on con continuous experimentation. So we figure out what captains like, what management practices the best, and now we roll it out. It's a company called Signal and that has scaled up our idea. And this idea is definitely scalable. So that's Virgin Atlantic. Um, and again, like now, now regulators like the Civil Aviation Authority in the UK is now starting to nudge and, and persuade these airlines to start thinking more seriously about how to create the right incentives and motivations for airline captains to behave optimally from a fuel efficiency point of view. Um, like they're not doing autopilot <laughs> for every part of their job. There are these margins that they can work on. That was the, the Virgin Atlantic experience. Then we have the SoCal gas work. 
Um, so this is a paper done by, by Bob Hahn, uh, published in the AER last year, where a lot of regulators, energy regulators around the world, try to give sort of price subsidies to low-income households. So energy subsidies are huge, like on the on the demand and supply side are huge. It's about like six to six to seven percent of global GDP value comes from energy subsidies. It's a huge amount. And so what we were able to do is take an example of these subsidies in California. It's called the California Alternate Rates for Energy. It's called CARE. And what they do is that it provides a 20% price discount, a marginal price discount. Um, for households at two times the poverty line and below. And so what we did is that we ran a natural field experiment with SoCal Gas. So SoCal Gas is, is, is the regulated entity, they're a private company, and they're regulated by the CPUC, the California Public Utilities Commission. And the CPUC mandates that these companies provide the subsidy to their customers. And so what we want to do is figure out, okay, what's the sort of the welfare effects of this, this price subsidy? So we wanted to know, okay, what's the price elasticity of demand for these consumers when they get this, this, this lower price in terms of their demand. So we, across 70,000 customers, we randomized an encouragement onto this program. And what we found over time, over, over 18 months, is that this program actually led to this 20% price reduction led to about uh, an 8.5 percentage point increase in natural gas. And so because this is like a monopoly in a market, customers can't move anywhere else. They, they have to be on this tariff. And so what we're able to show is through like a very simple model of whether this price subsidy would be welfare enhancing or welfare reducing from an efficiency point of view. And so now we were able to show that uh, it actually led to a decrease in efficiency and that the regulators, the CPUC, has to weight the low income population at 20% of the, the non low income population. So there's an extra weight that would have to be justified to, to actually justify this, this price subsidy. And now the CPUC is using this evidence to understand okay, like, are there alternative ways that we can provide the same welfare to these low income households without reducing efficiency? So you got like lump sum transfers or you got vouchers and so in that paper we were able to provide some counterfactuals of what would happen uh, with, our, with our sample if we give them, say, a vouchers or, or a lump um, sum transfer. And so that's where this evidence has been used by both, both sides of the market. Both sides of the market wanted to figure out, like, is this a good thing or a bad thing? And we partnered with, with SoCal Gas to be able to show um, some of the evidence or some of the parameters that the CPUC might actually care about. So that was um, the work with SoCal Gas, and again, that got into the AER last year. Um, then uh, we did a partnership with the YMCA, and like, this is with uh, Luigi Butera, who was on the panel um, uh, this morning, uh, Billy Morrison and, and Dmitry Tabinsky. And what we were doing was figuring out, you know, how all these governments and regulators around the world are trying to convince uh, companies to uh, you know, provide these social nudges to actually say, you know, you should tell people how bad or how good they are as consumers in comparison to some average or some, to some baseline. And so this became, you know, quite popular after the uh, publication of Nudge and the publication of Hunt Orcott in 2011, showing how social norms impact on energy consumption across 23 utilities in the US. Uh, we did some work in the UK on uh, taxpayers, and we said, that, hey, nine out of 10 people in the UK pay their tax on time, you're the minority. That led to a huge increase in, in tax paying. So the social norms, the social image has been like one of the biggest non-price interventions advocated by sort of the behavioral groups in every government uh, around the world. And so what we wanted to figure out in this study is, you know, could we actually measure the direct welfare consequences of those interventions themselves. So not saying like, do they change behavior? And then what's the, the benefits and costs of changing that behavior? We're saying, well, hold and fix the change in behavior. How does actually this intervention of telling people that they're good or telling people that they're bad actually affects their welfare? And that might dwarf the, the benefits and costs of changing their behavior. So we ran a partnership 
with the YMCA, where we ran a frame fail experiment, where we told people that um, their performance in the gym, in terms of how many times they attend per month, uh, the YMCA, would be publicly revealed to everyone in that area. And we randomized whether uh, they were revealed or not revealed. And in that field experiment, we were able to get the willingness to pay for every possible state of the world uh, to be revealed, conditional on the attendance. So we were able to show what is like the, through a reduced form and through a structural methods, what was the, uh, the shape of the sort of the public recognition utility function. And so in Benibu and Tyrol, that's like a linear uh, function. So those who are revealed, their, their increase in welfare would get totally offset by those that get revealed as bad types. So we actually directly tested that and we're able to show that in some cases that it's not a linear public recognition utility function and it might be concave. And if it's concave, then it's a net negative welfare program holding fix what happens to the behaviors uh, of the individuals and their benefits and costs. So now we're able to show that if regulators want to push these type of interventions onto companies, they should be well aware of A, you know, it might not necessarily be a good thing for all people. And B, now we have a methodology from this paper to actually understand for that sample that they want to intervene over, you know, would their public recognition utility function be linear, concave, or convex? I think regulators should want to know that because that will infer whether they should actually nudge these companies, these regulated entities, to provide such social recognition information. Okay, so, so even though the project was with a, a charitable organization, the YMCA, we are hopefully leading to insights that can help regulators and regulated entities around the world. So for example, uh, every, I would say most public utility commissions in the US, for example, pretty much mandate that these um, uh, utilities, these private entities actually provide social information on energy bills. So that's where Opower as a company and now Oracle have become quite an important player in behavioral energy efficiency is because the regulators are now telling them they should be providing that information. And so we want to put a little bit of a check on that and say, actually, for some people, uh, the net welfare changes might be negative rather than assuming it's going to be all positive for all individuals. Okay, so hopefully that will provide some evidence to the regulators. Fourthly is a paper uh, with um, uh, John List, uh, Ariel Goldschmidt, uh, Ian Murray, uh, Carrie Smith and, and Jenny Wang, where, again, we are working with a... a I would say a regulated identity. I think they're regulated by various transportation commissions uh, across the US. But we work with a rideshare company called Lyft. And um, what we wanted to do is say, well, could we design experiments and analyze experiments where um, the government has a particular value for a parameter in the regulation? So for example, the value of time in federal regulations around uh, especially in the US and other parts of the world, is about 50% of the wage rate. So if a government had a policy that impacted on consumers or companies, and it changed the, the time it took to actually commute or to consume goods and services, they would value your time at 50% of your wage rate. And that's become a number that's come from various studies over time, but that's kind of like the number that's being used. So we designed and analyzed experiments at Lyft that randomized price and randomized wait time across 14 cities in the US, where we have a clear counterfactual of what would have happened in absence of waiting longer. Um, in, that, in that paper, um, if you take a look at it, what we're able to show is that the value of time, which is a value of waiting time that we have, is about 75% of the wage rate across the cities that we, we do the experiments in, and that we can reject that the value of time is 50% uh, of the wage rate in most of our cities. So we think that the, that the regulators in the transportation world, at the very least, are undervaluing 
people's time saving benefits. And so that doesn't have impacts just on transportation as impacts on environmental regulation, for example. So if we think about trying to assess the benefits of any environmental uh, goods and services, the, the travel cost method has been used to design some of the benefits. And so, you know, if it takes people an hour to, to get to uh, a natural reserve or to see some ecosystem services, they would value that at between one half or one third of your wage rate. So what we're saying, actually, maybe the benefits are, are larger based on the field experiments that we've run. So again, it's working with a private entity to generate evidence and support for a particular parameter that policymakers or regulators might actually care about. And then lastly, um, I've sort of worked on a ton of papers with OPOW. So OPOW uh, was a company started in, in like 2008, I think 2009, uh, two Harvard MBAs who read uh, Cialdini's book um, of persuasion and thought, okay, could we actually persuade energy customers to reduce their energy, energy use? Um, because prices do not equal social marginal cost in the energy world, could we get a demand closer to what the optimal ought to be? So they started giving social norm, social norm information across uh, various utility customers around the US, and it led to tremendous savings. Uh, so Hunt Olcott in the j in, in 2011 was able to demonstrate uh, through, I think, 28 field experiments that this information led to a reduction in, in energy use. So uh, when I moved to the US, this is my, my first company that I worked with in trying to generate further evidence about how important um, doing field experiments are to generate evidence for energy regulators. So the first one was, uh, again, work with, with John, Alec Brandon, Mike Price, and um, Flora Rundhammer, where we were able to see whether this actually affected peak demand. So peak demand uh, in many countries is obviously a big issue. Uh, we don't have dynamic prices uh, in, in, in any country at a wild, wide scale level. So how do we actually get people in peak time, say in the summer months between 4 p.m. and 9 p.m. to not use energy? So we actually randomized a peak energy report. So we didn't change prices. We just changed information, telling them how much they consumed in the peak time compared to their neighbors. And that led to a substantial increase in conservation in that peak time. And what we showed is like having the home energy report, having the social norms more generally, doesn't crowd out the impact of this peak time report. And so that was published in, in PNAS where we were able to show that there's like additivity of two interventions, two nudges that are trying to get different margins to, to work on. And then like, I, I won't go through these papers in, 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 in a lot of depth, but then we've run like other experiments with O-Power um, because like they just, they've just got um, management of the organization that actually knows how important uh, causal inference is. They've done their, their MBAs at Harvard. They've gone through uh, causal inference classes and they understand, okay, like this is how we generate the best evidence possible for not just the utilities, but also for the regulators. And, and they are one of the reasons why most public utility commissions in the US today, like advocate for field experiments to be used to generate evidence. Not always, but in many cases they do. And that was to some extent, from the, the work that OPOW have done in convincing the public utility commissions that field experiment is the gold standard to be able to know whether, for example, a behavioral energy efficiency program worked or not. So that's kind of like some of the papers that I've done so far, but based on my Twitter poll and my LinkedIn poll, people didn't want to care much about that. <laughs> They'd rather care more about what I'm doing, okay? But this is just an example of, you know, that the econ profession does reward I think field experiments that are in regulated industries where you can provide like good counterfactuals on, on a parameter that the regulator and the regulated entity cares about. Okay. Okay. So now I'll, if there's no, no questions, now I'll go through some of the, um, some of the, the work that I'm currently doing. It's not published. Uh, please don't tweet this out to anybody. Uh, this is kind of like information that, uh, 
stays within these these four walls okay um and again like these are all uh projects that are to some extent interested to regulators and they're interested to regulated companies so doing work with the bay area rapid transit um organization to understand how to better um estimate uh or be better understand how to regulate in terms of peak demand and whether we can use sort of variable prices so we did a natural experiment and a field experiment with bart to be able to understand this then i've done work with british telecom in the uk because uh one of the regulators ofcom is very um you know very persuasive for these companies to to do field experiments generate evidence to, to leave these companies alone and to not regulate them too much. So British Telecom, uh, I had a field experiment with to partner on, a, on an experiment to understand how to get people to switch to another, another tariff. Uh, the third project I'll talk about is the ACT, which is an organization, a private organization in the US that provides um, test taken, standardized test taken to 11-year-olds, uh, 16-year-olds, 18-year-olds, adults as well. Um, and so it gets, it's an organization that gets students ready to go to college and assesses like their level of ability um, and human capital at sort of the 16 and 18-year-olds. So universities and colleges can make, uh, have, have a piece of evidence to help them in the admissions procedure. So we looked, worked with the ACT on a very, interesting area on, on low-income students of how to get low-income students to take the ACT and go to college. Uh, fourthly is SoCal Gas. So SoCal Gas is one of my favorite partners because like they've drunk this field experimental Kool-Aid. Kool They're like, yeah, like we now want to do field experiments on different areas to see what works. And so since COVID has happened, um, the regulators are really like clamping down on the utilities to not do certain stuff to customers. Like for example, don't turn off their gas supply. So right now there's mandates across the US where utilities cannot turn your gas off. They have a very important instrument that they cannot use now because the regulators say that's not fair. And so now we've come up with alternative strategies of figuring out how do we actually improve welfare for consumers under the guises of the regulator who is clamping down on these utilities. So SoCal Gas is one of my favorite partners to do field experiments because I'm just doing so many with them right now. And then the six is uh, WITCH, which is a consumer advocacy body in the UK. Uh, they're very close with the regulators in, in the UK, and they are very concerned about fake reviews on many websites, especially Amazon, Facebook, um, Walmart, Apple, where like there's just a lot of evidence that there's tons of fake reviews out there and they might be influencing behavior so we work with which uh, to design a field experiment where we could show how important fake reviews are and how detrimental they may be for for welfare so again the, the, the goods there are not like don't have externalities they're not like merit goods but it's like th thinking about how there's inefficiencies in the market due to fake reviews and can we think about ways to overcome that inefficiency and then la the last uh thing i'll talk about is um a, a field experiment with redfin where we wanted to see how um how given information about climate change impacts long-term impacts of our home might impact on search behavior and buy-in behavior and so um we, we we've designed an experiment in partnership with them because you know, should regulators mandate that all realtor companies provide the full climate change information to uh, those searching for a home? And should that actually improve the matching of where people go in terms of do some risk averse people want to, you know, pay a premium not to live in a flooding area, um, but they wouldn't know that unless they had the information. So we designed an experiment with them to, to figure out uh, how important this information is. Okay, so these are the type of companies that I'm working with right now that, um, you know, I don't know how where the papers will land, but, they, but we're working with sort of at least one side of the, the regulated market to understand how to generate evidence so that these markets could be better regulated in the future. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? Are we all good? Okay, fantastic. 
Well, this is a common problem, especially before COVID anyway. Um, maybe maybe uh, after COVID too, this will go back to normal. But congestion on like busy stations and busy trains in the morning commute and in the afternoon commute. So uh, we partnered with BART, um, the Bay Area Rapid Transit System, where we wanted to uh, see whether we could change off-peak prices for uh, consumers who were in like this peak zone in terms of the stations and the time uh, of the day and see how elastic they are and whether we can actually have a, a model that would say this leads to overall benefits or, you know, leads to an increase in overall benefits or does it actually uh, lead to overall costs? And so uh, I did one natural experiment. I only like met Bart like halfway through the natural experiment. And I try to convince them of the problems of just having <laughs> this like sign observational study. And so um, we analyzed that and then we got the data from uh, a field experiment that we ran in partnership with, uh, with Bart, where we actually randomized prices to move people on the different trains and see how elastic they are. Um, Hernan, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Hi, Robert. Uh, thanks for, for the great talk that you are giving. Uh, this topic is very uh, close to my heart. Uh, I wonder if you have some something in mind in, in order to evaluate the, the welfare impact of these kind of policies, because based on the big remodel of congestion pricing, people have like different uh, utility for arriving on time or late. And, the inflexibility of your working schedule or some other appointments, you might decrease congestion, but <laughs> damage social welfare. So I, I was wondering if you are thinking on, on, on doing something to estimate that. Yeah, no, I, we, we're definitely in that spot and I'll get there in about uh, 90 seconds. <laughs> All right, thanks. No worries. So, so what the regulatory problem here was this heavy congestion on trains between 7.30 and, and 8.30. And so, you know, one of the solutions could be, you know, could we actually include sort of, uh, oh, two things actually. Bart was interested in doing one of two things. One is, should we build longer stations and buy more trains? Or could we change prices? Okay, so obviously it's more difficult to do an experiment on the former. It's easier to do an experiment on the latter. So what we did is we, we randomized price subsidies to uh, BART Clipper users. So the Clipper card is a card that you use to top up money so that you can just you know, swipe in and swipe out of, of the stations. And so we randomized prices and we randomized whether we got them to switch to uh, earlier or later trains that we knew were less congested based on their expected departure time. So BART give us data on like the weight of every train and the weight is a proxy for how many people are on that train. And so we had um, an algorithm that could predict for a given consumer within a 40 minute window of either side of their normal um, uh, commuting time, which train they should be getting on. So we said, okay, we're going to pay people, uh, we're going to subsidize their journey if they get on that train. Okay, that's the field experiment that we, we ran. The natural experiment they ran was like, like much, much larger and included everyone. And they just had between 7.30 and 8.30, you'd get subsidies for not commuting in that time period. But the field experiment was a lot more precise about how do we actually, for each individual, know which train they should be nudged to go on to by the change in the price. So what we have is, you know, actually a lot of variation based on like the time of the morning that people leave and what time we get people to commute into. So as Hernan was saying, like there's, there's actually different welfare effects by different times of the day of the different people. So if we just looked at like the own price effect, so for the change of say the subsidized times, so say for example, I commute at 8 a.m. every morning, and then like the algorithm knows that a train at 7.40 is actually the le least congested train I should be getting on in like a, a window of 80 minutes, I'll get a subsidy for that time. And so I might get a 7.40 subsidy and I say like, okay, 
for that for that group who was offered 740 and in the control group who would have been offered 740 what's the impact of um, changing their behavior changing their demand based on the prices and so we actually find that some time periods it's really difficult to get people to change because of the schedules because of frictions in their life that they can change but there are some time periods sorry there's some time periods that are more flexible for for some people okay and then we got their usual time and it seems like again around eight o'clock eight twenty um around ten o'clock we do have significant reductions in their in their time normal time period of travel so these incentives did you know did work in getting people to actually shift their demand um the interesting data point that i haven't got here is people are more flexible in going later and starting earlier um, probably because of like the job that they're in is less flexible, childcare, whatever. There's, there are scheduling and frictions that would suggest that not every time period is going to be as elastic as each other. And that's exactly what we find here. So the cross price elasticities are different based on what time of the day we get people out of. Okay. But now we got a, we, we build a model of, you know, how can we estimate the welfare consequences of these price subsidies when price is not equal social marginal cost, okay? So we've got a, a very basic structural model that can work out, okay, what's the welfare effect of the subsidy at like every moment of the morning? So whether we make people go earlier 20 minutes or earlier 40 minutes, or we go late 20 minutes or later 40 minutes, okay? That's when the subsidy was offered. And this is on the, on the y-axis is the, the marginal value of public funds. So if the marginal value of public funds is one, that means that people that were offered the subsidy, they value that subsidy at the cost of the subsidy. Okay, so if the government was providing these subsidies um, at, at $10, then the willingness to pay for these subsidies uh, for the individuals is $10. But we can incorporate all the congestion costs as well. So this is gonna be uh, the marginal value of public funds, including the congestion costs as well. And so what we find is like, you know, they are around one, but there are some time periods that are above one. Okay, so these, these are time periods in which the value of the subsidy is higher than the cost of the subsidy. Okay, and if we compare that with, say, Hendren and, and uh, Sprung Kaiser's QJE article two years ago, where they compare like different labor market educational policies, is like actually, now, peak time subsidies or off peak shoulder subsidies are actually not a bad use of public money in comparison to say job training or nutritional vouchers or housing vouchers. Okay, so actually, you know, now we can generate evidence to Bart to say, well, actually, you know, you can change behavior of the consumers um, through peak time pricing it will probably be more efficient, we hope more efficient than building larger stations and trains because there's gonna be a huge dead weight loss of that. And now, Bart now has this program that they've scaled up to get more and more consumers into this optimal peak time pricing program. So I think the evidence that we've shown here though is like it takes time to figure out what is the optimal time to move some people and what is the price that you pay to move them. And I think there are just some time periods and for some people that like the cost of movement is just really, really high. And so we do want to focus these subsidies on the more marginal individuals. And that's where this algorithm with constant experimentation uh, gets us there. So that's an example of, you know, how a field experiment can be used to understand not just like is peak time pricing a good thing or a bad thing, but at what periods of the day are you going to get a bigger bang for your buck? And that's what this experiment hopefully shows to you all. Okay. Okay. Any questions about this field experiment? I have a quick one, actually. So, do you have any information on the types of consumers that change their behavior here? I mean, is it like poorer consumers that maybe really want that price reduction, and they're they're kind of overlooking potentially some other costs to move around, or and thinking about the welfare effects here? Yeah. So, I would say. All of these cons all of these BART users in the experiment are people who use BART at least three times a week in the morning in the very um, congested stations like Montgomery Street and Powell Street in downtown San Francisco. 
So we know that about them. Um, we know that they would not use a car to get to work because these are the people that are usually in the East Bay going westwards downtown to San Francisco. Like that tunnel is just like, that's the congested tunnel from a bar point of view. And the cars obviously on, on the, the bridge, the Bay Bridge are just like, you know, the, 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 even chocolate block. So these are definitely people who are not like mode shifters um, and they're sticking with bars, but we don't have enough uh, observations to know is it the you know the high income medium income low income that are changing their behavior um we just don't have enough like observational data from the experiment to know this we ran a survey with a small fraction of these but again we we're inferring more about you know where they would they were, where they would live and their neighborhood based on what station they depart from that's just, i think is most that we can do um but yeah, most of the people in this experiment are heavily, heavy users of BART and they commute at the peak times, go into the downtown stations, which is where the congestion was in the morning, which is where BART was most concerned about. And that's where they were gonna build these huge stations and, and invest in more trains. Um, so that's where we are. Hernan, go ahead. Yes, a little bit related to this. How you think about merging two of kind of your research, <laughs> this and the, the research with, with Uber, in which like you vary with, with like this discontinuity on when, when you resign to, to, to take a trip, barring the, the subsidy. So that I think that some kind of like tool like that will help you to evaluate the, the, the social value of, of the subsidy. No? Yeah, no, exactly. So um, I, I'm trying to get um, an algorithm working where, from like Google, if you turn on Google Maps on your phone, um, you, you, then you will get like the whole history of your travel period and try and get like randomization of like different modes and see how people switch modes at different times of the day. And I, th I think there's now an algorithm where you can like get people to upload their Google Maps history and that will give their location and give away like how they're commuting. And so like that's an experiment I want to run because I want to get the cross mode price elasticities, but no one's done that so far. So I, I'm definitely 100% behind your idea of, of trying to get, so, you know, subsidies for different modes as well. Uh, Nuridin, do you have a question? Yeah, hi. Um, um, I, first, I want to um, say hi to Hernan. He's an old grad school uh, <laughs> classmate. Hi. Good to see you, Hernan. <laughs> uh, and then I, I'd like to first compliment you, Robert, because, I mean, you're so productive. Um, you've done so much, you know, in a short period of time and with so many, you know, companies too. So I'd like to sincerely congratulate you, but my question is related to that. So how do you do it? Like, are you involved? Like, do you have a team or what is your strategy to be productive? Yeah. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, can, I, can I come to that towards the end of the, end of the talk? So I've got a slide just on that. If that's okay, if I could push okay, that. Okay, okay. Okay, cool. Thanks, Newton. thank you. Um, Jared, how much time do I have? Uh, you have about five more minutes of the talk. Okay. We'll have fifteen minutes Q and A. So, but feel free to you know to cover whatever you want in those five minutes. And then, okay, I'm just thinking what would be the best best one to talk about. Okay, so I want to talk about gas bills um, because that's not necessarily exciting um, for everyone here. Um, but the so-called gas work is pretty cool. But like, I'll talk about the ACT stuff. So this is where I think right now there's a lot of debate about like should colleges have you know use the ACT or the SAT to get their students to um, to admit to college. And so we work with the ACT on what's called like a fee wavering program. So every student that is on some sort of like their families on some sort of like welfare support, federal or state or local, that student gets as many ACT tests uh, that they want and they can apply to as many colleges as they want. There's no cost to them whatsoever. So the ATC, but, but for, for most colleges today, uh, there's a little bit of resistance the last year or two, but for most colleges, you've got to have an ACT or you've got to have the SAT to admit into a college. Because it gives you just like one more piece of information that admissions uses. Um, now, 
we were interested in in the fact that there are some states that mandate this so like you have to take the act to get into say a college in ohio and it mandates all the students to take it so what we were interested in figuring out is okay like in the states that there's some leeway that it's not a man you, know, you don't have to mandate you take the act not not every student does take the act in in ohio for example but like in states that have some leeway, like how can we encourage more of like these low income students who have a really good GPA at high school to get into college? And so what we did, we partnered with the ACT to do three large natural field experiments across the US where we sent like full information to the to the fee waiver students because we got their email address we know where they opened up the email and so what we're going to do is just like give them as much information about why they should be taking the act and as much information about the benefits of going to college and information on the scholarships that they could get trying to think about all of like the informational frictions we just give that to the students so that was two, two field experiments we ran and the third one was, well, actually, we couldn't provide incentives to the students. Um, we weren't legally allowed, but we could actually provide incentives to the schools. So what we did is we ran an experiment where uh, we sent a letter to the school counselor or to the, or the principal of the school saying, hey, there are 20 fee waivered students uh, in your school. If you get 90% of them to take the ACT test on this date, we'll put you into a lottery to win $20,000, okay? We randomized the, the dollar value and we randomized whether we give them a lottery or not, okay? So we ran this over three different years. Um, sorry, the slides are taking a bit slow to, to load up. And so we randomized reminders and information to students and then we ran, randomized incentive to schools to get most of their kids to sign up. So the results from the first experiment in which we give full information about uh, going to college, the full information about taking the ACT, uh, we do that in a positive frame and a negative frame. So we say, hey, like going to college, you'll get all these benefits. Taking the ACT, you get all these benefits. Uh, on the negative frame, we said, hey, like if you don't take the ACT, you lose all this. If you don't take going to college, you lose all these things. Nothing seemed to work. Okay, so given the full information to so these fee waivered students did not increase their likelihood of taking the ACT for the next two years. Okay, um, as, as you'll see, like about, only about 74% of those who are fee waivered actually take the ACT. So there's like about 26% of students who have a perfectly good GPA <laughs> don't take the ACT. Okay, the second experiment we randomized like reminders we randomize like how much information we give them so in treatment one remind them once treatment two remind them twice treatment three remind them three times and then four five and six we remind them the same levels but we ramped up the information and again nothing seemed to work for these students and get them to take the act really underwhelming this isn't this isn't even correcting for multiple hypothesis testing so when we do correct for that the standard errors obviously increase a little bit more but nothing seems to get these students to take the ACT, even though we've known that most of them have opened up the email as well. So then the third experiment, we actually randomized uh, incentives to the school counselors and to the principals. And boy, did that work? It did work. It got a lot more of the students to take the ACT. OK, so uh, let's just look at the, the, the third column, which is where we have the student characteristics control for and the school fixed effects. So we randomize at the school level, not at the, the individual level. And what we found, for example, is putting schools into a lottery to win $10,000 if they get 90% of their fee waiver students to take up the, the ACT, that increased the likelihood of about 4.7 percentage points over a baseline of about 70% in this. Okay, so we get a lot more students taking the ACT. And if we compare the GPAs, the school GPAs for those in this group versus the control group, there's no significant reduction. So we are definitely bringing in students who are not necessarily less, have less ability or are, have less human capital. They just now take the ACT. And now we're working on trying to link up with the college board as to whether they actually complete their four-year degree or not. That's what we're working on right now. But say in this whole experiment, we only got one student 
to actually go to college. Say so that like that was, you know, we got like this 4.7% increase, but only say that's about like 300 students. So say one of the 300 actually went to college, that's still worth it. Okay, so from an MVPF point of view, if we got one person to go to college, that incentive would pay for itself. It would pay for itself after four years, in fact, okay, of once that person gets into the labor market. So the MVPF is going to be infinite, which means that um, the program pays for itself without in the need for, for government money, essentially. So, like, this margin of where like these private companies can get more low income students to go to college is actually a margin that we should know a lot more about. I think this figure here is this school, this distribution of school fixed effects is where I think we should have more work. And this is the benefit of that third experiment where we randomize at the school level. So this is a distribution of the school fixed effects, holding fixed student characteristics, hold and fix the, the zip code of the school, all the observables, we still get like a huge variation in how the schools impact on how many fee waivered students take the ACT. So if you compare like this tranche of schools down here in comparison to the median, these schools on average get 50% less of their fee waivered students to take the ACT than the ones at the median, hold and fix all observable characteristics. So there's a lot more margins. Oh, there's a margin. There's, there's a margin at the school level where we can get a lot more low-income students to actually go to college. And even if we only get one student to go to college with a ten thousand dollar incentive, the MVPF it pays for itself. So that's again another example of where, um, you know, through a field experiments we can figure out we shouldn't be focusing on interventions at the student level maybe it should be at the school level. That's where there's a lot of variation. That's where these teachers, these counselors, and these principals can actually have a large impact. Okay, so I won't go through any more of the other field experiments that I've got going on. I'm happy to talk more about them. But I think um, uh, the, the question earlier on was like, how do I get, I think uh, Nuruddin asked the question of like, how do I get these field experiments to be done? I can't tell you how many emails and LinkedIn messages I send to get <laughs> these experiments done. Okay. I send a lot, and there's a lot of people that say no. Um, like, I don't know what my denominator and my numerator actually is, but like the, 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 the denominator is, is large. I try to ask a lot of companies, a lot of regulars that do field experiments, and a lot of them say no, but you only get to see the wins, right? So, so that's why I uh, probably got a lot of field experiments going on. Uh, I take a lot of Zoom calls and a lot of phone calls pre-COVID, a lot of traveling. And that was honestly like one of the benefits that I had from doing the postdoc. And I, I thank John List for, for having me at Chicago for the postdoc, is that I had time just to fly around the country, uh, convincing companies and regulators to do experiments. <laughs> and like that, that in-person contact is just so valuable. Um, and so like I, the SoCal gas stuff, the ACT stuff, um, the Virgin Atlantic work, the Uber work I've done in the past, the, uh, the Lyft work, this all came from like person to person interactions and figuring out more about the problems that they have from a regulatory perspective and how to do experiments. And then I've created two companies to help work on me <laughs> on projects and deliver these field experiments. So one of them is called The Behavioralist. Um, they are a consultant company based in, in London. And now they run a lot of field experiments with me. I have people working with them that talks to regulators on a, on a, on a frequent basis. So I'm not doing it myself. So I have a team of, of people in The Behavioralist that understands my objectives of publishing academic research, but also helping regulators and, and getting paid for that, which we can talk about as well. Then Signal is a company that I created that's based on the work of Virgin Atlantic, where we created a software as a service um, product that will actually be used by the aviation sector and now the maritime sector to understand how to increase productivity in these areas so that we can reduce fuel efficiency. And so, what I'm working on right now or getting started is working on maritime. So maritime, again, another big contributor to CO2 emissions around the world. There are captains in these boats who actually do a lot of work to actually get them from A to B. 
and they have no incentive to save fuel. So we're thinking about how do we create the incentives and the practices to actually get these captains to um, care about fuel use. And another project I'm doing is figuring out uh, like indoor air pollution. This is just like a, a big area that no one knows about. We spend 90% of our time indoors. We have no idea about the air pollution in the rooms that we're in. Uh, we have great PM 2.5 monitors uh, outside. We have none indoors. And so we're doing a field experiment right now where we are randomizing. Um, we're putting these monitors in people's homes and we're randomizing actually do they get that feedback or not, what margins they can work on and just figure out, you know, can people actually move the needle on indoor air pollution? So I think fun, I think like regulated industries are fantastic markets to run field experiments in. Uh, you know, we do need more theories tested where price is not equal social marginal cost. I think most markets price is not equal marginal social cost. And so like, I do think we need more, a better understanding of how uh, we understand say welfare when price is not equal social marginal cost. Secondly is, they are great for understanding the true policy counterfactuals because you're working with the regulators. So you know, okay, what would be the true uh, counterfactual to a certain parameter being tested or to a certain, a certain regulation. And then I think thirdly, which has been like my sort of pro-social benefits, uh, or pro-social reasons from when I was young is like, I want to understand better of how to regulate these markets where you do have externalities, where you do have frictions, where you do have, um, you know, merit considerations. And so I think you can impact on the welfare of many people by running field experiments in these markets. And I think both sides to some extent have the incentives to generate high quality evidence. I think there's a, there's a better understanding today than there was say 10 years ago, about the need to do field experiments, to generate evidence in these industries. I think for, for me, like I can see myself work in this area at least for the next 10, 20 years, because there'd always be a need for new markets arising where there's new regula regulations and we gotta figure out are they harmful or not and how to improve them moving forward. So thank you all for, for listening and feel free to email me about any of the projects that I mentioned or follow me on Twitter and I'm happy to stick around and, and answer any more questions that you all might have. So thank you all. Thanks a lot, Rob. That was a really great talk. And uh, as you said, we'll open the floor to questions. And I guess the main takeaway is that we should all be starting our own um, <laughs> to be productive, right? <laughs> Competition out there. Um, yeah, so feel free. I think, you know, people can just uh, sort of unmute themselves. I think people are able to unmute themselves or raise your hand. And, um... Robert? Yeah, Julio, go ahead. Well, uh, thank you so much for this great presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I have one question regarding the, the, the last uh, project, uh, the one of the SIT is, so uh, what is, uh, uh, do you look at uh, 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 to see what is the mechanism? That is why the school work, uh, because I was thinking that perhaps the student, well, it is costly to, I don't know, to prepare to take the exam and so on. And perhaps the, the school was facing part of that cost or, or not, or do you, do you know why it worked with the school and not when you reach the student directly? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a really good question. I, it's, I don't have a, a great answer. Um, in the sense of we wanted it to remain a natural field experiment. So we didn't do like any surveys with the schools, telling them, you know, uh, like how, what were they thinking about with respect to some of their beliefs or the incentives with or without like the lottery in this case. But I think what we were able to show, um, again, like the, I haven't got the paper publicly available, but um, what we have in the analysis is when the person identified by the ACT or, or the, the person who was connected to the ACT from the school was the school counselor. Not only is the average level of taking the ACT for fee waiver higher, but the impact of the incentive was higher. If the communication or the contact person was the school principal, their levels of, of of fee waiver students taking the ACT is lower and the treatment effects were actually lower. So it feels like this school counselor 
is a really important person to have in a school <laughs> of fee waivered students. And trying to incentivize them is important. Now, we, we wouldn't say we would give the school counselor money. We would say we would give the school money. But I think they have a higher incentive to show to the, the principal that, hey, they can do this job really well and they got money for it. And I think that's where one of the mechanisms that we, we think is, is coming from is like there's a direct accountability for the school counselor as opposed to the school principal. And like absence of that, I don't think they're given any incentives. Like the, the, there's no benefit to the school financially from getting more of its fee waivered students to take the ACT. Um, they encourage the, the students to take the ACT. So the ACT provide like documents and information that the schools can hand out to the students about this fee waivered ACT. But beyond that, like I'm beyond the pro-social reasons for getting more of their students to take the ACT and go to college. Um, I don't think there's any clear incentive. So I think what we've done here is provide a clear incentive for the school counselor to have some ability or reason to motivate more of their students to take the ACT and get recognition for that. Thank you so much. No worries, Julia. Any other questions? Well, I could ask a bunch of questions. I don't know if uh, <laughs> other people want to, though. I was actually interested in, uh, you, you mentioned something about getting people to take up new contracts. And that seems like a big problem in uh, a lot of different uh, utility markets. It's like sort of how to get people to switch. I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit and sort of what you see as the main frictions there. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I think, um, uh, so, so, that, so a lot of regulators believe in, like, in these concentrated markets so that there's like too much inertia and people are not aware of the outside options. And so we worked with British Telecom where we had about 600,000 consumers who were on suboptimal plans based on their consumption. So we knew that there was another plan within the same company where they wouldn't change their technology, we just changed their plan and it'd be a better plan for them from a cost point of view, holding the assumption that their previous consumption is a good guide to their future consumption. And so we, give a, we did a field experiment where we randomized, like we just told the consumers like everything about like, you know, if you switch to this plan, you'd be better off. So you move from a variable pricing plan to a fixed pricing plan. You'd be better off under the fixed pricing plan. We did this and like we provide full information and we knew how many people saw the information and like we got about a 10% treatment effect on a low baseline of getting people to switch. And so then we looked at, okay, what would be the, the benefits to these individuals who did not switch by switching? And then we run some sort of like different models of like the discount rates or how long they're going to be a customer. But it seems like the switching costs are around about like $800 for this sample. So the, 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 the cost of switching and the cost of a new contract is about $800, which is a little bit lower than the work that say Ben Handel has done on switching insurance um, contracts in the, in the US health market, but it's still a non-trivial cost. I think the regulators don't understand how costly it is for individuals to, to switch and, and wanna switch. And so I think we need a better understanding about what are these switching costs, where they come from. And like, we shouldn't just necessarily default people onto uh, another contract because there are potentially benefits that we do not observe in the existing contracts. I think for me, that definitely blew my, uh, <laughs> blew my mind in terms of how little switching we got, even when we told people that they can benefit X dollars by switching. Great, thanks. I guess we had uh, Hernan and then Yuval and then, and then Jesse. Perfect. Hi, Robert. So I was wondering if in any of the projects that you are doing, if you are incorporating these ideas uh, that you have in the paper with Luigi, because you, you motivated that a little bit on, 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 on the world or the field of energy efficiency. So how, how social welfare is costly, shame is to get X reduction in, in, in energy consumption. I don't know if you are exploring any of that in some of your new projects. Um, 
So I think some of the work that we are doing to expand on that in particular project is trying to um, figure out what would be social recognition um, utility if you have different levels of incentives. And so what we're trying to do is figure out like how important um, this sort of shaming or this pride will be if you have zero incent or zero prices or some magnitude higher prices. And so we now have like this, this methodology that we can apply to like any, any context. So we're doing this in, in the same area of, of uh, exercise, but I think you can apply it to like any, but I think for the work, the existing work that I'm doing, I'm not really doing anything that will hopefully shame or give pride to people. I, I, can't, I can't think if I am doing anything like that right now. Um, I think, yeah, I have one project where I'm trying to figure out, trying to randomize like social norms and see like, not just like what is this, what is like the average for the population, but if you can randomly assign people to different like social norms that affect their behavior, but I haven't gone too much into the welfare consequences of that right now. So, so the upshot is I'm still doing work on like this methodology to get at the, so sort of the, the, the welfare effects of shame and pride, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm still doing that on the same areas that I was before with Luigi and Dimitri and Billy, uh, but not really applying that to, to any new areas yet. Okay, great. Thanks. No worries. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering, uh, are you sometimes concerned that the long run effects of the incentives could backfire? Um, I'm thinking like we're paying for the schools to do what they're supposed to do. And OK, so the, if we incentivize them, then they make some more effort. But I would I I wonder if that's the best way to making them do their job, maybe um, explain them more how important it is that all the students go to. The, oh, so I'm, I'm trying to think of the. Uh, broader aspects yeah or consequences yeah it's a, it's a great question so i think for those incentives in the act experiment that i mentioned um we wanted to make sure that these incentives were mod were, were, were marginal not inframarginal and in the sense of like we said okay this is the list of people that have signed up your school normally gets 70% of the fee waiver to, to, to take up the test. Now it's been raised to 90%. So 90% was the level for every group in the experiment. And so we're definitely getting like, you know, the 20% increase for that school to be able to get the incentive. Now, if we take that away, that instead of away, what happens? Um, you know, we did have, we did that final experiment in 2017. We looked after and it didn't seem like those schools in the treatment group next year had like a reduction in number of fee waiver students taking the ACT. But I do think that if you can construct these incentives correctly for the schools and you get one extra person to go to college as a result of say a 10, 20, $30,000 incentive, it still pays for itself in the long run. So I think um, that, would, wouldn't investing this ten thousand dollars in giving this finding this guy and giving him a better education wouldn't it improve uh, his chances and give him better education? Like, if if you can find that person, absolutely. <laughs> if you can if you can convince one person, let's say ten thousand dollars, who wasn't going to go to college, but now they do go to college, that that would give an MPPF of infinity. Absolutely. So it's, it's about like doing experiments. So I think we can find who that marginal person is and whether they do stick it out and go to college and spend four years there and then get into the labor market for sure. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the question. All right, Jesse. Hey, Rob. Um, hey. Nice to see you again. Um, so you really piqued my interest when you mentioned your um, travel um, around the country and globe seeking out um, partnerships and the like, which obviously is super important for getting experiments like this actually off the ground. And so what I'm wondering is, 
in your experiences, have you had much luck or more luck with using um, like government angles uh, to improve or to try and run experiments to improve like environmental outcomes from, from firm pollution versus working directly with uh, firms themselves? Um, and ultimately, which do you think is more desirable from a research standpoint? Um, and this just seems like important, particularly when it comes to having a strategy to pursue partners, um, but also considering the need to, to get data to actually make projects work, um, but also especially in, say, development countries or in, in unique settings like um, airlines or, or the maritime industry. Yeah, it's another great question. So I think uh, I, I, I did, I, I try to figure this out through the trial and error method. So when I was in grad school and, and finishing grad school, I tried to go through the public, so the government angle, did that in the UK. And then when I moved to Chicago, I did that in the US by working with the social and behavioral sciences team uh, in the White House. And like, I just found it, I just found it more difficult to get governments to want to run experiments themselves. I think that was like my, I, I always had to get interest, but then I never wanted, no, no government wanted to actually run the experiment themselves and have like potential black backlash on them for running an experiment. So I feel like through the trial and error over time, like I've gravitated away from like working directly with governments and working with the companies who have an incentive to show a good finding in, in that market. And I think like, I, I really wish governments were more excited and were more willing to take risks on figuring out that what they currently do is not the right, <laughs> right thing to do and to run experiments, but I haven't been able to crack that. Um, and again, it might be the fact that I've got older now I'm getting better at running field experiments. I'm getting better at convincing people to run field experiments. So maybe I should try <laughs> the government again, but like at the early parts of my career, I just spent so much time. I just couldn't convince governments to run the experiments themselves. So that was like, I should say those governments were, you know, the UK and the US and federal and uh, state governments within those. But maybe like, you know, if I went to, uh, if I had the backing of J-PAL behind me, which I do now and I go to uh, a, a, a country that's not in Europe or in, in, in the US, maybe I'll have more luck, I don't know. But I, I, I was like annoyed of how much time I spent trying to convince governments to run experiments where they just wouldn't do it. Interesting. Yeah, that's kind of, that was my prior as well. And I haven't really dabbled or attempted to, to go after a, a government partnership per se, but um, also kind of important too, like if you think about the, the need to, to, to push MCP to MCS, um, which of, of, of those two channels for partners would actually uh, get closer to aligning private and social costs? Um, Totally agree. Totally but, agree. Great. All right. Well, um, thanks a lot, Rob. I uh, don't want to take up any more of your time. The, the sessions are going to start here in a couple of minutes. Um, so, yeah, thanks again. This is our last keynote of the, the conference. Um, and I guess this is the last time we're reconvening as a group. So thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, it's been a great conference, and this is a great, great end to it. So, um, yeah, looking forward to the, the last session and um, the, next, uh, the next conference next year in Buenos Aires. <laughs> thank you for your time. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Right, thanks, thank Rob. Bye-bye.